You heard some announcements uh, in our bulletin. I just would like to add one more. Next Sunday, not today, next Sunday, November 28th, there will be an opportunity to share a love offering with our intern youth minister, Bryce Parrott. So next Sunday, Lord willing, if God gives us life, please come prepared to share what God has blessed you with to encourage our young brother to continue faithfully working with the kids, with the teens, with the youth in our church. So before we go into God's Word, I need your prayers. I need prayer support because it's quite a text. And uh, let's pray for God to speak to our hearts and minds this morning in a special way. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity, for this Sunday you have given to us by your grace. You let us come to this place, to the house of prayer, to the house of God, where children of God get together to worship you and give, in, and give you praises, honor. Lord, fill our hearts with your supernatural peace, your joy, and Lord, uh, it must be, it can be always a joyful occasion when Christians get together to worship you in the spirit of truth. What a joy! It can be and it should be. Lord, please, let it be a joyful time of fellowship with you and one another. Bless this message, my heart, my mind, my lips, uh, to deliver it in a clear way, understandable way. But most of all, we're praying for the application of this word, for us to be the doers of the word, not uh, the hearers only. That's what we prayed and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, will you please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 24 through 34. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses uh, 24 through 34. The title of the message can be seen on the slide. Do we really trust God? Do we really trust God? Stop worrying. As an in, in the introduction part, I just would like to give you some basic information, some context uh, of the words of Christ in the text we are studying this morning. Not far away from us, uh, near the beautiful town uh, of Gladstone, there are several uh, old order Mennonites leaving. Have you been there ever? Just raise your hands. Did you ever stop there? Maybe you stopped there to buy either some meat or some, or some eggs or chicken meat or whatever. Or would you just stop out of curiosity to see how other people, they live on the farms, they farm the land, how they live without electricity and things like that. And you probably noticed even that horse buggy sign on the way to Gladstone and on the way back to Nepal. So once upon a time in the past, uh, some old order Mennonites uh, made up or created such a saying or proverb. We're not promised skies always blue, but a helper to see us through. I think it sounds beautiful. It has some deep spiritual meaning. We're not promised skies always blue, but a helper to see us through through. So, I need to give you some context here of this uh, passage to help us with the correct understanding and especially the application of this text. In Matthew chapter 9, which is a part of, in Matthew chapter 6, which is a part of the Sermon on the Mount of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord focuses in verses 19 through 24, before our text, 1924, Jesus focused on the attitude toward luxury, that is the unnecessary physical possessions men store up for selfish reasons. In verses 25 through 34, the Lord Jesus focuses on the attitude toward what men eat, drink, and wear the necessities of life that are absolutely must to exist. And let me ask you this. I hope in your life experience, my dear friends, you have realized by now that there's a big difference between uh, the necessities, the needs of life, and the wants of life. The needs, we cannot live, we cannot function, and the wants of life, or sometimes our selfish desires and ambitions. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 19 through 24, is directed at the rich people. 
while at the same time Matthew 6, 25 through 34 is directed at the poor people. The rich are tempted to trust in their possessions, and the poor are tempted to doubt God's provision. Like the rich, they have this problem of self-sufficiency. Like they have resources, enough food, enough equipment, enough probably machinery, enough money on the banking accounts, and they trust that they will be okay. While at the same time, the poor people, and the poor people actually are in the majority in this world, they are tempted often to doubt God's provision. God, where are you? I don't have enough. I'm in big debts. I don't have enough food in my fridge. I don't have enough clothing and shoes for my kids. God, where are you? You promised in your work to bless and sustain and maintain. The rich are tempted to become self-satisfied in the false security of their riches. And the poor are tempted to worry and fear in the false insecurity of their poverty. And there's one interesting passage. I'm really encouraging you to read it with me if you brought your Bibles to the church. It's written in Proverbs chapter 30. I remember the days when um, reading one of the devotionals way back in Ukraine, I paid attention to this verse and God spoke to my heart in a special way. Proverbs chapter 30 verses 7 through 9. It can be your prayer. And actually it's been tested by time, by God. It's a valid, it's a very good prayer of a believer. Uh, Proverbs chapter 30 verses 7 through 9. Two things I asked of you do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. A very interesting prayer. For some reason, God, by His Spirit, put in my heart desire quite many years ago to pray this prayer. That God, don't give me too much and don't give me too little. To me, to my wife and my kids, and I even pray for my grandkids. Because there's a strong temptation if you have too much, too many possessions, to forget who God is. Because you have too much to rely upon. Or if you're too poor, if you're really struggling to provide and feed your family, you will have another temptation to steal, right? And the history of humankind has proved millions of times that poor people, miserable people, they're really tempted to steal something that does not belong to them. Just to your prayerful consideration. You may say, well, Pastor Vlad, that's a, not a good prayer for me. Because I pray for God's blessings for me to become a millionaire, that I could help other people in, in Nipoa, in Minidosa, in Gladstone, in Carberry, and beyond. I just, if I become a billionaire, I'll be just giving some money away. You know, I may believe you, but not necessarily, because if you study the lives of millionaires and billionaires, yes, they give some money away, but do they give their last, very last thing away? No. If you have as much if you give even $100,000, that's nothing to some incredibly rich people. Let's go back to our chapter 6 in Matthew. Whether men are wealthy or poor, their attitude toward material possessions is one of the most reliable marks of their spiritual maturity or spiritual condition. The heart of Jesus' message in our present text is, don't worry not even about necessities. I don't want to ask you this question, my dear ones, my friends, uh, anything about your income or banking account. It's not my business. But the Lord God knows. And uh, CRA Canada, they know what you have, what you own. Believe me, they do know. 
how much you have or how little you have. But it's kind of very interesting. Sometimes, you know, when you come to the bank to do something with your account, I remember the days not here, but where we used to live before. I came, I don't know, to do some paperwork, and the lady of the tower looked at the computer screen and said, oh, you are quite a low-income family. And I was kind of, well, what do you mean, low-income family? Is it a sin to be a low-income family? At least I don't have debts or big debts. And what do you mean, low-income family? She told me, no, 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 no. No offense here. It's just a fact. <laughs> it's just a fact. I thought, okay, that's fine. The Lord gives this command not to be anxious in our text three times in verses 25, 31, and 34. And also gives four reasons why worrying, being anxious, is wrong. If you worry, it is unfaithful of our Master. If you worry, it is unnecessary because of our Heavenly Father. If you worry, it is un unreasonable because of our faith. And if you worry, it is unwise because of our future. So first reason why worrying is unnatural because of our master. Now let me just read verses 25 and 24 and 25 here. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. In other English translations, it says you cannot serve, serve God and mammoth. Uh, but here, just serve God and wealth. And verse 25, for this reason, the words of Jesus, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Let's just pause and stop here. For this reason, as we have just heard the words of Christ in this text, for this reason refers back to the previous verse 24 in which Jesus declares that a Christian's only master is who? Is God. He is therefore saying here in verse 25, because God is your master, you belong to God, you're owned by God, I say to you, do not be anxious. For Christians, worry and anxiety are not reasonable, but foolish and even sinful. In this verse, the Lord Jesus strikes at the tendency to center our lives on food and clothing, thus missing real, real life purpose and meaning. Our life is not about what we eat and what we wear. It's more complicated than that. The problem is not so much what we will eat and wear today. You can just look around at our beautiful, handsome church members and kids. By the grace of God, they came to this building having some clothing on and praise be to and some shoes. Nobody came barefooted. When we had this morning minus 12, it is not the problem what we will eat and wear today, but what we will eat and wear in five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road or from now. Such worry about the future is sin because it denies the love, wisdom, and power of God. It denies the love of God by implying that He doesn't care for us. It denies God's wisdom by implying that He doesn't know what He is doing. And it also denies God's power by implying that He's not able to provide for our needs. If God is not able, then it's my job. I need to do something to provide for my needs. This type of worry causes us to devote our best energies and strength to making sure we will have enough to live on. Then before we know it, our lives have passed and we have missed 
the central purpose for which God created us, human beings. God created us to worship Him. God created us to glorify His holy, holy, holy name. Not just to eat and wear shoes and clothing. God did not create us in His image with no higher destiny than we should consume food. I forgot to bring some chips or something to show you to demonstrate that life is more complicated than just and sipping and drinking something. We're here in this world. Listen, my dear friends, we are here in this world for the time like this to love, worship, and serve God and to represent His interest on this earth. Our bodies are intended to be our servants, not our masters. Your body, my body, is my servant not my master. So if you want to eat your ice cream and some pumpkin or cheesecake or apple pie at 10.30 p.m. next time, tell to this body, that's enough. Go to bed. You know this body where the fridge is, you know where the dessert is, but go to bed. You'll survive until next morning. The command, do not be anxious, in the Greek original language, means to stop what is already being done. Stop it. In other words, we are to stop worrying and never start it again. That's what Jesus was meaning when he said those words. What is the opposite of worry? Contentment. Oh, that's a hard one. A Christian's contentment is found in God. And only in God, in His ownership, control, and provision of everything we possess and we will ever need. In fact, Psalm 24, 1 says, Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. In it. Always keep in your minds and hearts that the earth is the Lord's. He created it. He owns everything. He controls everything. Everything we now have belongs to whom? Does it belong to you or me? You may think so. Everything now we have belongs to the Lord. And everything we will ever have belongs to the Lord. Why then do we worry about His taking from us what really belongs to Him? Even your body belongs to the Lord. Your body, according to the Scripture, is the temple of the Holy Spirit if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Your body belongs to God and your body belongs to you. Your body does not belong to anybody else. And if you are married, if you're a man or woman, if you're married, your body also belongs to your spouse, to God, to your spouse if you're married, and to yourself. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is our responsibility to thank God for what He gives us and use it wisely and unselfishly. So that was the first reason, not to worry. Worry is unnatural because of our Master. Second reason why worrying is wrong. Worrying is unnecessary because of our Heavenly Father. Verses 26 through 30. Let me read those beautiful and powerful uh, words of Christ. Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Hmm. The basic meaning 
of these verses is that a believer has absolutely no reason to worry because God is his heavenly Father. To illustrate his point, Jesus shows how unnecessary and foolish it is to worry about food, life expectancy, or about clothing. Subpoint A, worry about food. Verse 26 again. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? This phrase, the birds of the air, illustrates God's care for his creatures. He is creator. If he created something, he promised to maintain and sustain it. They, the birds and animals, preach to us how unnecessary it is for us to worry. Whenever you see birds in the air next time, think about it, how God preaches to us through them. In God's hierarchy of creation, human beings are of more value than the birds. Why am I saying so? Because it's only about us when God says, let us create them in our likeness and image. We are created in the image and likeness of God. We have incredible dignity as human beings. The crown of God's creation. Incredible privilege and dignity. We're special in God's eyes. We can surely expect God to take care of our needs. Martin Luther, the great reformer, of the church once described his favorite preacher. I know that some of you have your favorite preachers. You just watch and listen to online or TV. He had a favorite preacher too, the great German reformer. I have one preacher I love better than any other. It is my little Robin. Robin is a little bird who preaches to me daily. I put his crumbs upon my windowsill, especially at night, he hops onto the seal when he wants his supply and takes as much as he desires to satisfy his need. From the window sill, the robin always hops to a little tree close by and lifts up his voice to God and sings his carol of praise and gratitude, tucks his little head under his wings and goes fast asleep to leave tomorrow to look after itself. Your heavenly Father feeds them. This phrase does not promote any sinful idleness. Don't get me wrong, our hardworking people, wherever you work, I'm not promoting any single idleness today. When in fact, in Scripture, in Proverbs 19.15, we read, Proverbs 19.15 says, Laziness cast into a deep sleep, and an idle man will suffer hunger. Laziness cast into a deep sleep, and an idle man will suffer hunger. There's a kind of an interesting, a totally contrary proverb created by some Slavic nations in Europe, including Ukrainians, where you can hear from them, if you have a great desire to work, let it go. Take a nap, it will pass you. So it's kind of a, you know, if you really have to work, just take a nap and it will go away. away. So it's not biblical because it's, in the, it's not in this book. Proverbs 19.15, laziness cast into a deep sleep and an idle man will suffer hunger. Subpoint B, worry about the expectancy of life. Aha, uh -huh. now we know what we're talking about. Verse 27, and who of you by being worried, can add a single hour to his life. The words of Jesus Christ. The second illustration from Jesus has to do with the life expectancy. Our culture in Canada is obsessed with trying to lengthen life in this physical flesh. We exercise. We eat healthy, some of us. Supplement our diet with vitamins and minerals, some or many of us. Get regular physical checkups. 
get all kind of medications, including vaccines, from all kinds of diseases and illnesses, and do countless other things in the hope of adding a few years to our lives. Now, here's the good news. Are you ready? God has bounded the life of every person in this world. God is in control. He counted all your days and our days and my days. Exercise, good eating, and other common sense practices are beneficial when done in a reasonable way and looked at in the right perspective. They can improve the quality and productivity of our lives, but they will not force God into extending our lives span. They will not enforce God if God set up how long, how we are, how I'm supposed to live. Let's go to the book of Psalms, chapter um, Psalm 90. It's a very good one for all of us Christians to know. Psalm 90, verses uh, 9 and 10. Psalm 90, verse, uh, verses 9 and 10. I think it's a psalm written by Moses. Psalm 90, verses 9 and 10. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our days like a sigh. I'm 70. I'm 75. I'm 85. As for the days of our life, they contain... 175 years now, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years, yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. This is what the Word of God says. My dear ones, and I'm including myself, I'm not there yet. If you're 70 years old, give praises to God. You made it, seriously. If you're 80 years old, please raise your hands. Don't be, we'll just give praises to God for your long lives. Who is over 80? Raise your hands. Wow. Wow. Praises be to God. Do we have anybody over 90 in our midst this morning? Okay. Uh, some of those younger fellows like my age and young, oh, 90, yeah. So it's there. If God has given you 70, 80, if God has uh, let you live 100, 90 years old, but we're not in this aging flash forever, it will go to the grave or to the stove, whatever your kids decide to do with your dead body. You can worry yourself to death. You can worry yourself to death, but not to life. Fear, stress, and worry break us down. They are the unseen sources of headaches, backaches, heartaches, belly aches. We can go mental if we worry too much. We can suffer then from paranoia or psychosis of some kind. Seriously, it's a fact. It's science. If you're stressed out all the time, you go mental. And if you don't have faith in living reason Savior, you'll go mental quicker. Stress and worry produce everything from obesity to obscenity, from constipation to diarrhea, and from impatience to impotence. One doctor once said, you do not get stomach ulcers from what you eat. You get ulcers from what is eating you. What is your major fear today? You children of the Almighty God. John Calvin, pastor, Swiss reformer, once upon a time said, those who are extremely anxious wear themselves out and become their own executioners. Well said, Brother Calvin. We don't want, I hope not, we don't want to become our own executioners before our time. Subpoint C, worry about clothing. Ah, oh, that's an easy, easy one. Verses 27 through 30. And which of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? <clears throat> and why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, 
that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? Good question. So this third illustration has to do with clothing for tomorrow, using flowers as a model. After this service, just out of curiosity, when you go back to our comfortable, well-heated homes, check your wardrobes. Check how many shoes you have. I'll never forget, it's a real story. I stayed many times in the house of my Christian friends in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and once uh, one of the kids uh, told me, I'm, I'm not giving you his name, otherwise when you're in Minneapolis next time you'd like to visit that home, that family. He was a teenager, a young man, maybe right after school. I asked him, well, how many pairs of shoes do you have? And the young American lad, grown up in a Christian home said, I think I have 40 pairs of shoes, 40 pairs of shoes, boots, uh, uh, basketball shoes, uh, cross-country running, uh, high boots, uh, low-cut boots, and shoes for this and shoes for church and uh, shoes for something else, 40 pairs. Out of curiosity, when you come back home, count how many pairs of shoes you have at home. When I share this story in our former church uh, in Swan Valley, Real story. One lady in the middle of the message raised her hand and saying, Pastor Vlad, can I say something? Sure. She said, kind of, she turned, uh, yeah, she turned red actually. She blushed. She said, I think I have around 70 pairs of shoes. 70. I thought I was, I was going to impress our little flock there with the amount of American lad shoes, but she said 70, and she confirmed later on 70. When in the middle of the message I stopped, I lost the, all, the, all my thoughts. 70 pairs of shoes. That's pretty cool. So she's well to go. If God feeds the birds and clothes the lilies of the field, he will feed and clothe us. It is our little faith that hinders him from working as he would. The Lord has great blessings for us if we will yield to him and live for the riches that last forever. The third reason why worrying is wrong. It is unreasonable because of our faith. Verses 31 through 33. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. Worry is inconsistent with our faith in God and is therefore unreasonable as well as sinful. Worry is characteristic of unbelief. To worry about material things is to live like unbelievers, is to live like pagans. We should not spend our lives in anxious pursuit of food and drink and clothing for our future. The unconverted Gentiles live for the accumulation of material things, as if food and clothing were the whole of life. But it should not be with us, Christians, who have Heavenly Father who knows and provides for our basic needs. Uh, the fourth re reason not to worry. It is unwise because of our Father. Verse 34. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Each day. The Lord God makes a covenant with his followers. He says, if you put me first in your life, I will guarantee to meet your basic needs. Verse 34 represents God's social security program. The believer's responsibility is to live for the Lord, trusting God for the future with unshakable confidence that he will provide. 
And I would like to give you one powerful example of God's provision and care for his people. Remember how God provided for Israelites in the desert on the way to the land of promise. What did he send them to eat? Donuts and double roasted from Tim Horton. No, he sent them to eat what? Manna from heaven. What was its flavor like? Like honey. And in Exodus chapter 16, those verses 13 through 21, please read them today or tomorrow, Exodus 16, 13 slash 21. The principle here is very simple. We are called to live one day at a time. Tomorrow can worry about its own things. One day at a time. You know, there's one maybe some other very positive thing about this ongoing global crisis pandemic in the world. This crisis has taught us some good things. Do not plan too much or too way ahead of time because you don't know what's coming around the corner. You really don't know. Enjoy and live this day of your life. Application number one. Worrying about tomorrow does not help either tomorrow or today. The average person is crucifying himself between two thieves. The regrets of yesterday, who, oh, why did I do that? Oh, I should have done better. And the worries about tomorrow, who. Number two, it is right to plan for the future and even to save for the future. Please read those passages at home. 2 Corinthians 12, 14 teaches us parents that it is our responsibility to leave an inheritance behind for our kids. 2 Corinthians 12, 14. And 1 Timothy 5, 8, if you read it at home, teaches us that we're called by God to look after our loved ones, to look after our family members. But it is a sin to worry about the future and permit tomorrow to rob today of its blessings. Point number three. Three words in, in this text, Matthew chapter 6, 24 through 34, point the way of victory over worry, anxiety. Faith, verse 30. Trust in God to meet our needs. Father, we have Father in heaven, verse 32, knowing that he cares for his own children. And finally, putting God first, uh, verse 33, in our lives, so that he might be glorified. And point four, if we have faith in our Father and put him first, he will meet our needs. He will meet our needs. He will put us something on the table, our daily bread. He will give us enough clothing to wear and enough shoes. Matthew 6, 24 through 34 is about faith in Jesus Christ and its sufficiency regarding our basic, basic, basic needs in life. I'm not talking about luxury. That everyone, every church member next week will start driving BMW or Mercedes. No. But if you have four wheels and they spin, give thanks to God. Ask people I'm asking you right now. I think there's a verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians 4, 6 says, we should memorize it. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let me pray. Yes, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this very applicable lesson we need to learn to go on our earthly journey. You promised you promised to provide for our basic needs. You did promise that. And our life experience, our spiritual journey with you has testified thousands of times that you have been faithful. We're not starving now. We did not starve in the past. 
as children of the Almighty God. You've given us, you give us enough bread, enough meat, enough vegetables, enough water to enjoy the life as long as we are here in this world. Lord, thank you so much for your love, for your compassion, and for your faithfulness. And Lord, increase our faith and trust in you and teach us how we can pray deeper and better. Trust in you with our basic things in life. That's what we ask and prayed for. And all God's children said, Amen.